Hi guys, welcome to the 10,000 subscribers Q&A. Today I'll be answering 15 questions that you asked me both from the form I put out and here on YouTube. But first of all, thank you so much for supporting my journey and supporting this channel. I've been making videos for the past two years now and in that time I've gotten several messages, prayers, appreciations and success stories from all of you and it gives me so much joy. Getting scholarships for my masters and PhD really changed my life and that's what I want you guys to experience too. And if you haven't subscribed already then now is a good time to do so. Just hit the button below. It's free. <laughs> you don't pay to subscribe. Just hit the button. So I've divided the questions into four sections. Admissions and scholarships, visa approvals, writing tests and getting jobs after your studies. And if you watch this video to the end you'll Will learn some things that would definitely avoid you from making some mistakes. Let's go for it. So Diriba is asking, can I get great assistantships with 4.0 CGPA on a 5.0 scale and no work experience? So first of all, let's change this 4.0 to a 4.0 scale and see what it is. So that's 4.0 times 0.8, 0.8 which is like 4 over 5, 3.2. Now this is just a calculator conversion. If you do it with West, the West calculator online, you'll get a more accurate conversion of what it is. So with 3.2 over 4.0, can you get great assistantships? Yes, already you are above the minimum requirement for a lot of programs which is 3.0 over 4.0. And in addition to that, if there are other things that you do to strengthen your application profile, like you write the GRE, maybe you don't have work experience, you already said that, but you write the GRE, you might have some publications, you tell a very good story in your SOP. These are all things that can improve your profile. And if you are applying to a program that is not very competitive, then you stand a good chance of getting great assistantship. Yes, even with a 3.2 over 4.0. Next, Blessing is asking, is HND accepted for masters? Yes, but you have to do something first. You have to do an evaluation, like a West evaluation on the transcript so that you can convert it from that HND into a US equivalent, something that the schools here in the US understand. And then they can grant you admission and scholarships on the basis of that transcript. Yeah, so submitting your HND transcript as it is will most likely not be understood and recognized, but when you evaluate it, it will. That's what one of my students did who finished with a high GPA in her HND. She did an evaluation, applied to multiple schools, and now she's currently doing a fully funded PhD from HND. Oheneba is asking, I have a bachelor's of science degree in information technology and over the past two years I've applied for master's programs in cybersecurity and information systems but these programs barely come with funding. I need your advice on this. All right, two things. I'll say the university and the program. Let me talk about the program first. The reality is that a lot of programs in the business school here in the US don't have very good funding. For example, I did my master's in Bowling Green State University in Applied Statistics. Now, Applied Statistics had a College of Business program and College of Sciences program. The College of Sciences was more funded than the College of Business program, although they were the same Applied Statistics. So the information systems that you're going for is most likely in the College of Business and that's why it might not be well funded. But then the second thing I said I was going to talk about is the school. Although in a lot of the schools, it might not have a lot of funding, there are several other schools schools, you will see where this information system, cybersecurity has very good funding. It might take you more time to find them, but it's worth the efforts when you finally do. Martin Ebuka is asking, how can you get fully funded scholarship to the USA? What's the next thing to do after admission? How do you get fully funded? The answer is to submit a strong application to a program you stand a good chance of getting funded. When I applied for my PhD, I applied to five schools. I got admitted in three. I was in the waiting list in one. I'm still in the waiting list two years after. And I got that denied admission in the other one. Now, if I apply to five schools of the category that was denied admission, I won't have stood a chance. So there's also you finding programs that you stand a good chance of getting scholarships from. But at the heart of it, make sure you have a strong application. Make sure your transcript, your SOP, if you are writing 
tests like GRE, score very high in it, your work experience, let it align with what you want to study. Like everything should present you as the ideal candidate that they should admit and fund. What's the next thing to do after admission? It's to get your visa. That's just the next thing. Hopefully the admission came with a scholarship. So the next thing to do is apply for your I-20, book an interview date for your visa interview, prepare for it and get your visa approved. Then you travel over here. Cynthia is asking, what do you think of someone who has over 12 years of study gap? Is it possible to get into grad school with funding? Yes, yes and yes, it's very possible. It's one of the reasons why I love the US. The academic system is very flexible. Real example, there's someone currently in the master's version of my program at Kennesaw State University. His name is Greg. One of the way he introduces himself is when he had the, the first 30 something years of his career, he did not play with numbers. He enjoyed everything he did, but he didn't use numbers at all. So he decided that he should come back to school for a master's in data science so that he can start playing with numbers. Yes, he's in his 50s or 60s. And so you see someone like that that has 30 something years of study gap, he still got admitted into the master's program with funding. So the years of study gap is not an issue. Cynthia is asking, at the point of submitting your SOB for PhD, you were still doing your master's. Would you be graded based on your undergraduate degree only or they still required your master's transcript and OS evaluation? That's a good question. For those that don't know, when I was applying for my PhD it was like between December and February and I was still in the master's. I graduated from the master's in April. So at that time, I was doing my master's in Bowling Green State University and I could generate an unofficial transcript from the website. And so I submitted my undergraduate transcript, evaluated and the unofficial master's degree transcript. So that was what they used for all the semesters I completed so far, which was three semesters because I was in the final semester at the point of applying. And so they used that to decide whether, whether or not they would give me admission. However, before I started the PhD, I had to submit the official completed master's transcript. And I didn't need to do evaluation for my US transcript. Although for my bachelor's, I needed to do West evaluation. Abosede is asking, I want to apply for a master's in environmental science, I already took the GRE exam, but my GPA is 2.81. I'm looking for schools that can give me funding or great assistance. If you can help me with schools, most of the schools are three points upwards. First of all, I must commend you that you've actually taken steps to improve your profile by choosing to write the GRE. That's really good. Now, in addition to that, yes, the minimum for a lot of programs in the US is 3.0, but you can also find those that take 2.7, 2.8, or even 2.5. I've done a video on that, which is here. You can watch that later. So you can find those schools, the ones that offer your program and plan to apply to them. There's even also a way to get into these 3.0 schools. Now, if every other part of your component is strong, your GRE, your work experience, your recommenders, your statement of purpose, you can reach out to a program coordinator, sending them your transcripts, your CV, and forming a relationship with them. Now, if they've seen your CGPA and they still tell you to go ahead and apply, then you have a good shot. So I advise you to also reach out to program coordinators before you apply. Tolu Lope is asking, I would like to ask that did you return to Nigeria after your master's program to apply for visa for your PhD program or you got it in the US? Um, first of all, <laughs> you can't get a US visa in the US. It's just like you can't get a Nigerian visa in Nigeria and you can't get a Ghanaian visa in Ghana or wherever country you're watching from, you can't get your country's visa within the country. So I traveled to the UK last year to renew my visa, but you must not go as far as the UK. A lot of international students here usually go to North American countries that are around, like Dominica Republic or Bahamas to renew their visa. But definitely I wasn't going back to Nigeria to get it renewed. Like. It wasn't even an option. <laughs> Abe is asking, when you get a fully funded scholarship or a grant assistantship that comes with full funding, do you still need to carry a bank statement when going for visa interview? When you get admission into a university, what do you need to get your I-20 form. All right, so this is two questions. No, you don't have to carry a bank statement if you are fully funded. And what it means to be fully funded is that your total cost of attendance, which is going to be on your I-20, living expenses, tuition, everything is completely covered by your scholarship. So there's no need to go with a bank statement. When I was going to renew my visa in the UK, I didn't have to go with the bank statement because it was fully funded. But the first time when I was going for my master's, I got a significant scholarship, but it was not fully. So I had to go with a bank statement. 
so after admission what do you do to get your i-20 usually after you've gotten admission the international office would send you a form where you have to fill in a couple of your details and how you plan to fund your studies then in addition to that form you are also meant to attach a bank statement and they'll tell you the exact amount that is meant to be in that bank statement so you attach it and send it over to them when they see it it looks good to them they will send you your i-20 which is what you use for the visa interview so it's the international office that would send you that requirement bentio is asking what are the questions visa officers ask undergraduate students during visa interviews it's the same questions <laughs> that they also ask graduate students the visa officer majorly are trying to find three things number one do you have strong ties that will bring you back to the country number two are you a student are you really going for this degree that you got admitted to or are you planning for this to be your escape route so that you come over to the u.s and you do something completely different so they're trying to see your intentions and third can you afford the studies so is your financials good are you on full scholarship who is sponsoring you what's your relationship with the person so these are the questions that they will ask i've done a video on questions that you can be asked during your visa interview so you can check it out to get an idea and i'll do a video soon on questions that they ask on the graduate students during their visa interview Prisca is asking please i heard that some schools are not known in usa and because of that they reject students that gain admission in the embassy how true is it it's a lie it's not true <laughs> It's not true. There are almost 4,000 colleges and universities in the US. There is no visa officer that would know up to half of that. So those people that are probably telling you these stories that is because the school is not well known. That's why their visa was denied. They, they need to look at, actually look at their transcript again. What did they say? Did they sound convincing? Did they show strong home ties, strong financials, strong interest in that program? So they probably were not well prepared and because they were denied, they attributed the reason to be that is because the school is not well known. B underscore ETL is asking, do I need GRE to have the chance to wider range of universities in the USA for my master's degree coming from Nigeria or is not a prerequisite in my case? If you are looking at admissions, then you don't really need the GRE for masters. Yes, if you are looking at admissions without scholarships, then you don't necessarily need a GRE. You can just apply with your first degree to as many schools as you like and you most likely will get several admissions. But if you are now looking at getting scholarships, then a GRE would help to grant you access to a couple of the programs that are highly competitive. So if you are going for the big programs, the Ivy Leagues, the programs that are very competitive and you want to have a good shot there at getting admitted and funded, then the GRE would help very well. Goodness is Emmanuel is asking, when you know the GRE is waived for a university, do you advise one to submit their score if it's high or just move to schools that require it? This is a good one. If a program has said that they don't consider GRE for their applicants, whether or not you get a high GRE and you apply there, it won't be considered. So in essence, it's not strengthening your application. If you're written GRE, it's good that you find programs where it's required or recommended, not programs where it's completely waived. Ibrahim is asking, if I finish my graduate studies, am I able to stay there and get job opportunities and live there for the rest of my life? <laughs> since we are from Africa and here we are facing lack of opportunities. Yes, you can. That's the good news. That's one of the reasons I love the US. You can. If you are in a non-STEM degree, we have an OPT, optional practical training, that allows you to work in your field for one year after studying. If you are now in STEM, because everybody gets one year at first, if you are in STEM and you are in an e-verified company, you probably learned that about that later when you come over here. You can then renew that one year for two extra years which makes it three years for stem and one year for non-stem now after this one year and after the three years that's not the end of the story because your company can file work visa for you so you get changed from the f1 visa which is student visa to h1b which is work visa so yes there is that opportunity to stay back here work get experience and access better opportunities finally chidima is asking someone advised people in their video not to study subjects like chemistry or biology in masters as there are no job opportunities for them please say something on that i just need reality in your answer thanks i don't know i don't know where this advice is coming from this this is one of the reasons why i started this channel because there are so many rumors and people sharing things that are not necessarily true chemistry and biology specifically i have 
several friends that are here that have studied biology and have studied chemistry. A friend of mine, he graduated from chemistry May this year. He graduated from Kennesaw State University. He's already working as we speak. Several people, I know like five, six people who studied biology when I was in Bowling Green State University. And some people are doing their PhD because that's something about the biology route. Speaking with one of them, they told me that the job opportunities and the huge pay, that's the huge pay in the job opportunities, they mostly come to PhD holders in biology. So a lot of them, after they finished masters in biology, they move over to get a PhD in biology. If it's about opportunities, definitely, there are a lot of opportunities here for biology people and chemistry. Another way you want to verify this for yourself is you can go on LinkedIn, change the location of your search to United States and whatever job position you want to do after your biology degree, type it in there and see if any opportunities will come up. I can promise you that a lot, <laughs> a lot of opportunities, you'll see a lot there. Even chemistry as well. Whatever thing you want to do after, type it in there. Make sure the location is United States and then check. You see several openings, several opportunities. That's just really to give you a glimpse of what is available here in the US. A lot of questions that were sent in were on getting scholarships. And the good news is that I have a master class where you can hear the success stories of other international students just like you. And you can check that out over there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being a subscriber to the channel. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll see you soon. Bye.